Welcome, and thank you for accessing this resource. My name is Leah Weber. I am the PREA Director for the Wisconsin Department of Corrections. This resource is intended for facilities that partner or contract with our agency for the confinement of inmates and youth. Staff working in a community residential program, residential services program, alternate care facility, residential care facility, or county jail may all benefit. Please review the definitions of a confinement facility within the PREA standards to ensure that your facility is considered a covered facility. For some, this content may serve as an introduction or overview of sexual abuse dynamics in confinement and the PREA standards. This content is not intended to stand alone or replace PREA training, but rather supplement PREA training you may have received or will receive from other sources. At the end of this discussion, I will provide you with additional training resources. I hope that you glean information that contributes to your understanding of sexual abuse and sexual harassment in confinement, and also to your agency's efforts to adopt and comply with the PREA standards. Despite our varied work locations and missions, we share many things in common. At the top of that list is a commitment to the safe and respectful treatment of inmates, youth, and offenders in our care. Collectively, we've made tremendous progress in incorporating the PREA standards into our daily operations. While the standards may feel cumbersome or even overwhelming, each and every standard helps us to achieve our mission of safety, security, and well-being. If you are new to this conversation, welcome. Just a couple of notes before we begin. I will use the word offender to describe any DOC inmate, youth, or offender in your care. You may more commonly use words like client or resident. I may also toggle between victim and survivor and sexual assault and sexual abuse. While our community conversation tends to use the term sexual assault, the PREA standards reference sexual abuse. We'll talk about definitions in just a bit. For those interested in a discussion of your facility's contractual responsibilities, as they house DOC offenders, please reference your contract and the accompanying webinar titled PREA, Contractual Agreement Overview and Agency Expectations. You can find that in the same location that you access this material. And finally, before we begin, I ask you rhetorically, why do or should confined survivors matter to us and our communities? Well, for most of us, we very much value that all people have the right to be free from sexual abuse, assault, and harassment. No one deserves to be sexually abused. But some don't necessarily hold that same belief. If you scroll to the comments section of an article about someone who's committed a heinous crime, you'll often see equally heinous comments. Things like, don't drop the soap, I hope what he gets what he deserves, or good luck meeting Bubba. If you're ever in the position of having to justify or explain the rights of those confined, I hope you'll remember that people are confined as punishment, not for punishment. Proponents of PREA have said, no one is ever sentenced to five year, years in prison and five sexual assaults. Those confined in the United States cannot be legally punished by being beaten, being infected with a disease, by being driven mad, or by being raped. With that, I would offer that an offender's experience while confined matters to us, the community, their community. After all, the great majority of offenders will be released into our communities. Whether they are part of our families, serving us a meal at a restaurant, coming to our home to fix our plumbing, or parenting a child in one of our child's classrooms, we regularly interact with people who have previously been confined. I can assure you that they will share their experiences with their families and their communities, whether those experiences have been good, bad, healthy, or unhealthy. We are all stakeholders in their confined experience. We want to ensure that we provide a safe and controlled environment without victimization or trauma. We have a vested interest in ensuring that their experience is as rehabilitative as possible. With that, let's begin. At 
the core of the Prison Rape Elimination Act is zero tolerance. Zero tolerance for sexual abuse and sexual harassment of offenders. All of your agency's efforts to prevent, detect, and respond to sexual abuse and sexual harassment should have roots in zero tolerance. The standards require that all confinement facilities have a written zero tolerance policy in addition to a written plan to prevent, detect, and respond to sexual abuse and sexual harassment. A written statement and policy may be the first step in shifting culture. So what's the scope of the problem? The Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Statistics collects a host of data related to sexual abuse and confinement. Their data collection tells us that one in 10 former adult inmates and youth report being sexually abused while confined. Just as in the community, we must acknowledge and contend with underreporting. Concrete numbers are hard to define. We'll talk about some of the barriers to reporting for confined people in just a bit. But this conversation begs the question, what is sexual abuse? How does the federal government define it? First, though, let's define consent. In most settings, consent is given when someone is willing and able to freely agree to be part of an activity. There are a host of variables that may make a person incapable of consenting. If they don't agree or are unable to agree because they are asleep, unconscious, drugged, afraid, feeling threatened, don't understand what's going on, or are under the age of 18, then they have not consented. They are unable to. Because staff members have power, control, and authority over offenders, offenders can never consent to sexual activity with a staff member, even if they appear to agree. It is always against the law for a staff member to engage in sexual activity with an offender. Again, even if it appears the offender was a willing participant. While it's not a violation of criminal law for adult offenders to consent to sex or sexual behaviors with one another in a confinement facility, it may be a violation of Wisconsin Administrative Code or your agency's rules. Offenders engaged in consensual behavior may be subject to discipline within your agency. However, as we'll discuss in a moment, consensual sexual activity between offenders is not considered sexual abuse. This behavior does not fall under the Prison Rape Elimination Act's definition of sexual abuse. Before we move on to definitions of sexual abuse, it's important to pause to consider and discuss the role of consent and youth. In Wisconsin, the age of consent is 18, meaning anyone under the age of 18 is unable to legally consent to engage in sexual activity. While two minors engaged in consensual sexual activity may be a violation of the law, their consensual contact may not be considered sexual abuse for the Prison Rape Elimination Act. It can be confusing, but it's an important distinction. I trust that if your facility houses minors, you have robust policies and procedures regarding reporting conduct to Child Protective Services and or law enforcement. So what is sexual abuse? The Prison Rape Elimination Act offers us two definitions. The first definition is for offender on offender sexual abuse. I'll pause for a minute and allow you an opportunity to read this definition. Please take special note of the role consent plays in this definition. The second definition set forth by Priya is of staff on offender sexual abuse. Again, I'll take a minute so you can review this definition.
I hope you've noticed that there are several differences between these two definitions. They're important to mention. The first is the inclusion of the word with. That is with or without the consent of the offender. It denotes that even if an inmate appears to consent to any of the bulleted items with a staff member, it is still sexual abuse. Second, it only takes contact between the mouth and any body part to be considered sexual abuse. If a staff person kisses an inmate or vice versa on the lips or anyone else or anywhere else, it's sexual abuse. Priya understands that security staff and medical personnel, for instance, may have contact with an offender's genitalia, anus, groin, breast, inner thigh, or buttocks to ensure safety and or health. Strip searches are an example. Medical-related examinations are another. It provides protection, this definition, provides protection for staff so long as the contact is within the confines of their official duties. As you've probably noticed, the standard for staff is much higher. In this definition, a staff person, contractor, or volunteer need only have intent to abuse, arouse, or gratify sexual desire. Contact does not need to be present. Similarly, any attempt, threat, or request to engage in the described activity constitutes sexual abuse. Another item that doesn't exist in the offender and offender definition of sexual abuse includes any display of a staff person's uncovered genitalia, buttocks, or breast in the presence of an offender. And finally, voyeurism appears in this definition where it does not appear in the offender on offender definition. Voyeurism simply is an invasion of someone's privacy, specifically an offender's privacy by a staff member, volunteer, or contractor for reasons unrelated to official duties such as peering at an offender who is using a toilet in their cell to perform bodily functions, requiring an offender to expose their buttocks, genitalia, breasts, or taking images of all or part of an offender's naked body or of an offender performing bodily functions. Again, voyeurism is not included in the offender and offender definition of sexual abuse. In addition, in addition to sexual abuse, the Prison Rape Elimination Act says that offenders have a right to be free from sexual harassment. Again, there are two definitions, one to address offender on offender behavior and another to address staff on offender. Please review these definitions. Do you notice any differences between the two? Well, one difference is that offender on offender sexual harassment must both be repeated and unwelcome. While staff on offender sexual harassment needs only to be repeated, it doesn't matter if it appears the inmate or offender welcomes, consents, or even enjoys the comments or gestures. The offender on offender definition also includes sexual advances and requests for sexual favors whereas the staff on offender definition does not. Please remember the staff on offender definition of sexual abuse. Sexual advances and requests for sexual favors where no touching is involved when perpetrated by a staff person is considered sexual abuse, not sexual harassment. And finally, retaliation. Retaliation falls under the umbrella of behaviors offenders have a right to be free from as set forth by PREA. Retaliation is not defined by the PREA standards, but may include the behaviors described on the screen. It's important to consider that not only is retaliation the presence of verbal or physical harm, but also the removal of programming and opportunities. Being removed from a work assignment or moved to another housing unit or losing privileges can feel equally retaliatory after a report of sexual abuse. Now that we have a basic understanding of some critical definitions, let's turn our attention to the characteristics that make someone more vulnerable to sexual abuse. Understanding the characteristics that put an offender at higher risk for sexual victimization creates awareness and may greatly improve your agency's ability to prevent and detect sexual abuse and sexual harassment. While not absolute, BJS data has shown that the following characteristics make an offender more vulnerable in a confinement setting. 
Those with a mental illness, physical disability, cognitive limitation, or developmental disability are certainly more vulnerable than others. Anyone who is small in stature for their age, anyone who is a first time or young offender are often unexperienced in a custodial setting and with the culture of corrections or the written or unwritten or understood code of conduct. For this reason, the PREA standards mandate that youthful offenders that is, anyone who is 17 years old or younger and sentenced in adult court have sight and sound separation from adult offenders. Next, inmates who don't speak English as their first language or at all often have difficulty understanding their rights, setting boundaries with other English-speaking offenders and or reporting danger. Priya asked that all offenders who have limited English proficiency or disability may be able to benefit from PREA education efforts. Naturally, anyone who's intoxicated or under the influence is more vulnerable than others. And oftentimes, offenders are resource poor, meaning they lack financial, physical, or emotional resources to meet their own survival needs. Perpetrators or predators look for these perceived weaknesses to gain favor or prey upon their victims. These predators offer to buy resource poor offenders canteen, protect them on the yard, or be a shoulder to lean on in the day room. Some may consider this protective pairing, but it may also be considered grooming, as this relationship is disguised as a friendship, more often than not, and does not come free of charge. An exchange of goods or services must be made. And so if an offender is unable to repay a canteen debt, for instance, they may be forced to repay sexually. Sex becomes currency. Where do sex offenders rank in the hierarchy of a confinement setting? I hope you agree at the bottom. Not that that's a right stereotype, but that's certainly socially where other offenders may place them. As such, they are oftentimes more vulnerable. But the two greatest indicators of vulnerability are prior sexual victimization, whether in the community or confinement, and identifying as or even being perceived as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, gender nonconforming, or having an intersex condition. Let's pause for just a minute and discuss what can be some confusing constructs for some. It's important to sort out sex assigned at birth, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation as people who don't identify as straight or cisgender are confined disproportionately. And moreover, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender offenders experience sexual abuse at even higher rates than the general population. Please remember, sexual abuse is motivated by power and control, not identity or orientation. It should go without saying that anyone of any gender identity or sexual orientation may be victimized. Being informed about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression will enhance your skill set so you can build more meaningful rapport with offenders. The topic of gender identity or sexual orientation can be sensitive. I certainly respect that people may have differing beliefs and opinions. By presenting this material, it's my hope that we can enrich our understanding of those in our collective care, custody, and supervision while improving inclusive, respectful communication. When discussing gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation, there are a lot of concepts that can be similar, overlapping, and sometimes confusing. While there are a few important phrases you should understand, please keep in mind, terms and definitions alone will not tell you all you need to know about people, as people have uniquely defined versions of their sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. These evolving, fluid, and highly personal versions are represented by the arrows on this visual aid. We all have a sex assigned at birth, a gender identity, a gender expression, and a sexual orientation. And each of these exists on a spectrum. Sex assigned at birth is just that, what a doctor declares at birth. It's a boy. It's a girl. Medical data, however, tells us that not everyone fits neatly into one of these two boxes. Some people have an intersex condition. If you're unfamiliar, intersex is a less common combination of anatomy, hormone, hormones, or chromosomes. It's a medical condition. Some people walk through this world without ever knowing that they have an intersex condition. 
For others, it's more obvious. It manifests in the form of external genitalia, for example, looking different than what we would stereotypically consider male or female. Gender identity is a person's internal sense of being male, female, both, neither, or another gender. A person's gender identity is not necessarily visible to others, and no one can know someone's gender identity without them sharing that information. We all have a gender identity. The word transgender is an umbrella term that encompasses a wide range of people whose gender identity or expression may not match the sex they were assigned at birth. Transgender is not a sexual orientation. Transgender people can have any sexual orientation. They can be of any age, race, ethnicity, or religion. They may come from any economic status or educational background. They may live with disabilities or illnesses or not at all. Transgender people can and do have the same qualities as non-transgender or cisgender people. Prier recognizes that offenders who identify as transgender or who have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria or who may have an intersex condition are at greater risk of sexual abuse. All offenders shall be screened for risk of abusiveness or victimization upon entry into a confinement facility during which time they should be asked if they identify as transgender. If an offender has an intersex condition or identifies as transgender at admission or at any time during their confinement, PREA requires the facility to respond in the following ways. Agencies are required to make careful housing decisions. Housing and programming assignments shall be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Transgender offenders shall not be placed in dedicated facilities, units, or wings solely on the basis of their identification. Restrictive housing cannot be used as a means of keeping a transgender offender or any offender safe. Placement decisions shall ensure the offender's health and safety, which includes giving serious consideration to the offender's own views of their safety and any management or security problems. Placement and programming assignments shall be reviewed by classification or an equivalent every six months to review any threats to safety experienced by an offender. And finally, Transgender offenders shall be given the opportunity to shower separately from others. Gender expression is reflected in the ways a person outwardly presents themselves. Gender may be expressed through clothing, grooming, speech, likes and dislikes, body language, social interactions, and a host of other behaviors. We all have a gender expression. These cues may intentionally or unintentionally communicate gender to others and may or may not align with a person's internal gender identity or how they want someone else to perceive their gender. We are conditioned to measure these cues or expressions based upon our culture's stereotypical definitions of femininity and masculinity, but not all people conform to one or the other. In addition to masculine or feminine, people may express themselves in a more androgynous way or as a mix of genders. Finally, sexual orientation is the gendered pattern of a person's attraction to others. This attraction may be physical, emotional, sexual, or spiritual. We all have a sexual orientation. Again, defining terms doesn't help us to understand who people are. When working with people, we should remember that each person is a unique individual and try to truly understand who the person is rather than labeling them. Just as all people are unique and have their own gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation, all people also have unique ways of responding to an experience of sexual abuse. Every survivor responds differently. However, there may be some signs or symptoms that indicate that something has happened to an offender. Be alert, ask questions. Emotionally or psychologically, survivors may experience guilt, shame, embarrassment, helplessness, hopelessness, depression, mood changes, sudden mood swings, difficulty concentrating, isolation, withdrawal. They may appear distracted or distant. They may experience fear, anxiety, panic, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, disbelief, numbness, suicidal thoughts, flashbacks, confusion, anger, and specifically for youth, they may exhibit adult-like sexual behaviors or have knowledge that might uh, be better, that might be more appropriate for adults to know. 
Physically, signs or symptoms you might notice can include sexually transmitted infections, pregnancy, headaches, stomach aches, unexplained injuries, changes in appetite or sleep, difficulty swallowing, trouble walking or sitting, bleeding, self-injury, use of drugs or alcohol, inadequate personal hygiene, hygiene and for use, um, in addition, may exhibit bedwetting. All of these physical and emotional reactions complicate a survivor's ability to come forward and make a report. What other barriers stand in a survivor's way of reporting? According to BJS data, the majority of sexual abuse and confinement goes unreported. Data shows that nearly two-thirds of offenders victimized by another offender never make a report. So what are some reasons that survivors don't report sexual abuse and confinement? Well, for the same reasons as in the community, they may be embarrassed, feel guilty, a sense of shame, or take on a sense of responsibility, may need protection from whomever is harming them. They may fear retaliation or being blamed. They don't trust the system. Their reputation may be at risk. Again, they may need their partner or their abuser. Oftentimes, it's joked about in a way that we would never dare joke about sexual abuse in the community. We trivialize sexual abuse and confinement, and thereby we marginalize survivors and their voices. Our cultural conversation about sexual abuse in prison is marked by laughter. Google for a minute, or when you have a moment, John Oliver and prison. There's a short compilation of media clips that highlight how prison rape jokes make their way into popular media. Other reasons that offenders don't report include staff may be abusing them. They might fear being removed uh, from programming that they value or moved to another a facility entirely. They believe that sexual abuse, as we've all been taught from a very young age, that it's to be expected in a confinement setting. They fear being ostracized or isolated. The fear of retaliation ranks very high among offenders. They also feel fear being labeled as a snitch or a victim, which are two incredibly powerful words that serve to keep people quiet. And sometimes victims or survivors may, know, may not know to report because they don't consider themselves victims. They may not recognize that the behavior is sexual abuse because they've experienced similar, similar behavior as a child, adolescent, or adult. Simply put, it's their normal. In addition to the unique reporting challenges and confinement, let's think about the other dynamics that exist in this environment. In a shifted light, of course, all of these dynamics have the capacity to occur in the community. It's just that they thrive in a different way in this setting. While all sexual abuse is motivated by the need to control, humiliate, and harm, there are unique manipulative and coercive behaviors specific to offender on offender and staff on offender sexual abuse. Things like favors, bartering, denying privileges, grooming, protective pairing, and on and on. All of these dynamics blur boundaries. Consider that staff also have a unique ability to deny privileges, which may serve as leverage. We also know that because of the routine nature of daily life in confinement, an offender may be in close proximity to their perpetrator. They may revisit the location of the, the abuse nearly every day, or hear, smell, see other reminders of the abuse in a way that doesn't always exist in the community. Offenders don't have the ability to circumvent unsafe, whether real or perceived, circumstances in the same way that survivors in the community may be able to. The question then becomes, how does an acute crisis like sexual abuse interrupt a victim's ability to manage life in confinement? How does it affect an offender's ability to follow rules, get up to go to meals, participate in recreation, work, be near the perpetrator, and on and on? These constant reminders of sexual abuse or the traumatic event can greatly impact how offenders react to the abuse. It may even complicate or compound existing trauma and may trigger the offender to behave in unpredictable ways. This unpredictability can create safety concerns for staff and other offenders if not, appropriately if not appropriately addressed and managed. 
If we turn our attention to youth for a moment, it's important to recognize that the kinds and variety of life experiences that promote growth, self-discovery, and self-esteem are often very limited in confinement. They have a very limited ability to assert their independence, take risks, and experiment sexually, all milestones that are critical to normal and healthy development. Many youth also have significant histories of complex trauma and oftentimes they lack any supportive or nurturing adult role models. The same can be said for adults. Oftentimes their support system and ability to access those outside supports are significantly limited. Their ability to trust staff members within the facility may be limited as well. While victims in confinement experience trauma as a victim in the community would, opportunities for healing may be different or limited, which is one critical reason facilitating support services following an experience of sexual abuse becomes so important. And finally, control. People who are confined have very little control over their lives, choices, and environment. Sexual abuse further strips incarcerated people of their power and control. Without rigid or controlled, excuse me, within this rigid or controlled environment of confinement, the question also becomes, is it possible to return a sense of control to a survivor? I challenge you to think about the ways that you might be able to return a sense of control to a victim or survivor in your setting. For instance, if you must interview a survivor, ask if they prefer a meeting in the morning or the afternoon. Ask if they prefer, prefer that the door remain open or closed. Give them reasonable choices. Help them to understand the process and their role within it. So now that we know a little bit more about the dynamics of sexual abuse and confinement, what can we do about it? Well, PREA gives us a roadmap. The Prison Rape Elimination Act was signed into law in 2003 after unanimous support from Congress and years of pressure from advocates and survivors. But it wasn't until 2012 that standards, or our roadmap, were developed. All of the PREA standards can be nestled into three categories, those to prevent, detect, and respond to sexual abuse. There are dozens of standards for prisons and jails, community confinement facilities, and youth facilities. There are hundreds of provisions for each. We won't discuss all of them today. Instead, I'd like to review the standards in broad strokes. For a more in-depth discussion or information regarding the PREA standards, please refer to the PREA Resource Center, which may be accessed at www.prearesourcecenter.org. Prevention is the bedrock of PREA. Effective prevention both enhances protective factors and reduces risk factors. To begin, PREA directs all confinement facilities to have a zero tolerance policy. Specifically, zero tolerance for sexual abuse and sexual harassment. This policy statement shall also include an outline of the agency's approach to preventing, detecting, and responding to such conduct. An upper level agency-wide PREA coordinator shall be identified to oversee the organization's efforts to comply with PREA. This person shall have sufficient time and authority to dedicate to this effort. If your agency has more than one facility, a compliance manager with sufficient time and authority shall be identified in each facility to carry out facility level compliance. There are a host of provisions related to hiring and promoting. Specifically, the agency shall have protections in place so as not to hire or promote anyone who may have contact with offenders who has engaged in sexual abuse in a confinement setting, has been convicted of engaging in or attempting to engage in sexual activity in the community, by way of force, threats of force, coercion, or if the victim was unable or did not consent, and finally, or has been civilly or administratively adjudicated to have engaged in any of these previous activities. Prior incidents of sexual harassment must also be considered when determining whether to hire or promote someone. As such, in addition to asking prospective employees during the hiring process or current employees during the promotion process, if they have previously engaged in any sexual misconduct, the agency must conduct criminal background checks, 
on all staff every five years. The agency or facility is also responsible for asking prior institutional employers about their history and in turn providing information on substantiated allegations of sexual abuse or sexual harassment involving a former employee when asked by a prospective institutional employer. The supervision monitoring, excuse me, the supervisioning and monitoring standard is twofold. First, facilities are required to have a written staffing plan on record. The staffing plan must demonstrate adequate staffing levels and, where appropriate, video monitoring to protect offenders from sexual abuse. The staffing plan must consider generally accepted correctional practices, any findings of inadequacy from external or oversight bodies, the facility's physical plant, including blind spots or areas of isolation, the composition of the offender population, the number and placement of supervisory staff, facility-based programming by shift, prevalence of sexual abuse incidents, and any other relevant factors. This plan must be reviewed annually by the agency's PREA coordinator. In addition to the staffing plan, supervisors shall conduct unannounced rounds during all shifts. Unannounced rounds are conducted to identify and deter sexual abuse and sexual harassment. The facility shall also have a policy in place to prohibit staff from alerting one another a supervisor is conducting such rounds. For those without an unannounced round policy or practice, consider how you'll document these rounds. Consider, for instance, requiring supervisors to log their unannounced round in a logbook using a red pen. This is a low-cost, low-tax solution to this particular provision. For youth facilities, the supervision and monitoring standard includes an additional element, that is, a staffing ratio. During waking hours, for every eight youth, there must be one staff person. During sleeping hours, for every 16 youth, there must be one staff person present. The only exception to this expectation is during limited and discrete circumstances. In the event of a circumstance that prevents the facility from maintaining this ratio, the facility shall document the explanation. A youthful offender is a minor, anyone 17 years old or younger, who is sentenced in adult court. If a facility houses youthful offenders with adult offenders, they must ensure the two populations have sight and sound separation. When sight and sound separation is not possible, the facility must provide direct staff supervision. Youthful inmates cannot be placed into an isolation or restricted setting to accomplish this type of separation. They must be permitted access to exercise, education, programming, and work opportunities. Next, cross-gender viewing and searching. Facilities shall not conduct cross-gender strip or body cavity searches except in exigent circumstances. Whereas adult male offenders may be pat searched by a male or female staff person, adult female offenders may only be pat searched by female staff members except in an exigent circumstance. Youth may only be pat searched by a staff member of the same gender. The same goes for strip searches. What is, though, an exigent circumstance? It's a temporary and unforeseen event which requires immediate action to alleviate a threat to security or institutional order. In many cases, a staffing shortage, for example, is not an exigent circumstance because it is neither temporary or unforeseen. The agency must train staff to conduct cross-gender PAT searches and searches of transgender inmates in a professional and respectful manner and in the least intrusive manner possible, consistent with security needs. Moreover, the facility must have policies and procedures in place to allow offenders to shower, change clothes, and use the toilet without being viewed by non-medical staff of the opposite gender. To achieve this protection, opposite gender staff shall announce their presence when entering a housing unit to give offenders an opportunity to cover up. This may take the form of a verbal announcement, a tone or a doorbell, or a light. Any offender who is disabled or who has limited English proficiency must have an equal opportunity to benefit from the agency or facility's efforts to prevent, detect, and respond to sexual abuse and sexual harassment. 
This may include providing interpreters or translating or modifying written materials. Education and training is a significant piece of the prevention pie. Both offenders and staff must receive education and training. At intake, all offenders must learn of the facility's zero tolerance policy and the ways in which they can report sexual abuse or sexual harassment. Then, within 30 days for adults and 10 days for youth, offenders must receive additional comprehensive education, which details their rights to be free from sexual abuse, sexual harassment, and report-related retaliation. The comprehensive education must also include a discussion of facility or agency policies and procedures for responding to such incidents. All staff who have contact with offenders shall also receive education. Please remember, this training does not replace the PREA-related training staff shall participate in. Training must entail a discussion of the agency's zero tolerance policy, how to fulfill their duties to prevent, detect, and respond to sexual abuse and sexual harassment, offenders' rights to be free from both, including report-related retaliation, dynamics of sexual abuse and confinement, common reactions, detecting and responding to actual and threatened sexual abuse, avoiding inappropriate relationships with offenders, communicating effectively and professionally with offenders, including those that identify as LGBTI, and finally, complying with mandatory reporting laws. Staff who work with confined youth must also learn about age of consent laws. Volunteers and contractors who have contact with offenders must also receive training. In addition, any staff member who provides medical or mental health care or who investigates incidents of sexual abuse or sexual harassment must receive additional specialized training. Finally, all of this training must be documented. Inmates, offender, residents, training, in addition to staff member education and training must be documented so please consider where you might document and how you might document. Next, all offenders must be screened for risk of potential victimization or potential abusiveness. Within 72 hours of admission, offenders must be assessed using a variety of measures like age, stature, history of prior victimization, LGBTI identification, perceived vulnerability, and more. This information shall be used to determine, to determine safer housing education, work, and programming assignments. Ultimately, the goal is to keep those at risk of victimization separate from those at risk of abusiveness. Adult offenders must also be rescreened within 30 days of their arrival so that any new relevant information can be considered. Finally, any modification to the facility's physical plant or video monitoring technology must enhance the facility's ability to protect offenders from sexual abuse. Let's move on to detection. We've already reviewed some of the emotional and physical signs or symptoms of sexual abuse. Let's discuss reporting sexual abuse and sexual harassment. First, all staff, contractors, and volunteers have a responsibility to report any knowledge, information, or suspicion of sexual abuse or sexual harassment that occurred in the facility or any confinement facility. Staff are also obligated to report any report-related retaliation or staff neglect or violation of job duties that may have contributed to an incident of sexual abuse or retaliation. Naturally, staff shall report to a designated supervisor. They must also be able to report privately if desired. There may be alternate ways staff in your agency are encouraged or required to report as well. Staff shall not review, reveal information related to the incident to anyone who is not directly involved in making treatment, investigation, or security decisions. Confidentiality is paramount. If the offender is a minor, additional notifications must also be made to Child Protective Services and parents or guardians. How can offenders report an experience of sexual abuse or sexual harassment? Hopefully your agency has or will consider multiple methods. At minimum, the agency must provide offenders with a method to report internally and externally. Internal reporting options are varied. They may include directing offenders to notify any staff member, 
accepting written complaints, or establishing a hotline. The external method requires coordination with outside partners. The external agency cannot be part of your agency or facility. They must be able to receive reports and forward them to the facility for their review and action. Offenders must also have the option to remain anonymous using this external method. In addition to accepting reports from staff and offenders, the facility shall also accept reports from third parties. A third party could be a family member, a friend, an attorney, or another support person. Like any report of real or imminent harm, I trust that your facility is well-versed to respond to such information. Let's talk through some of the response-related standards that PREA sets forth. When responding to an alleged victim, consider best and evidence-based practices, like trauma-informed care. Following a report of sexual abuse, victims or survivors oftentimes experience re-victimization. There are many ways individuals or institutions treat survivors insensitively in the aftermath of victimization. Re-victimization, for some, can feel more traumatic than the initial harm. The immediate interactions a survivor has with a first responder may determine the future outcome of their engagement with treatment and the investigative process. The reactions of first responders may have the most significant impact on the long-term healing of a survivor. We'll talk about first responder duties next, but first let's explore the response-related PREA standards. First, the facility shall have a written coordinated response plan on record this plan should detail the action steps following an incident of sexual abuse. It should include the action steps of first responders, medical and mental health care providers, investigators, and facility leadership. For maximum benefit, post this plan in a location that's accessible to those who need to know. In the event, in the event an offender reports an experience of sexual abuse at another confinement facility, say a Wisconsin Department of Corrections prison, an out-of-state jail, or a youth facility five years ago, the head of your facility must notify the head of the facility of the alleged abuse within 72 hours of receiving the initial report. If the incident involved a youth, notifications shall also be made to Child Protective Services or the equivalent agency. Document that these reports were made. Next, there are a host of expectations regarding the provision of health care following an incident of sexual abuse. Very simply, the facility must provide emergency and ongoing care. Victims shall receive timely, unimpeded access to emergency medical care and crisis intervention services. This includes information about and access to emergency contraception and sexually transmitted infection prophylaxis. All sexual abuse victims shall be offered a medical forensic examination or SANE exam. Consider, in advance of the incident, where you might transport an alleged victim for a SANE exam. Does your local hospital have a SANE exam on staff? Do they have a nurse on call, for instance? On an ongoing basis, victims shall be offered medical and mental health care consistent with the community level of care. Offenders shall be offered pregnancy tests, access to pregnancy-related medical services, and STI testing. All treatment services must be provided free of charge, regardless of their cooperation with the investigation. Moreover, an offender who, who may have sexually abused or who has sexually abused another offender shall be evaluated and offered treatment as appropriate by mental health care staff. In addition to medical and mental health care, victims shall be connected to support services. This may include internal support, such as a social worker or chaplain. For youth, they shall be permitted to access their parents or guardian. And if the offender is transported for a SANE examination, an advocate from your local hospital should, should accompany or may accompany and support that offender. Similarly, an advocate from the local sexual assault service provider may accompany and support the offender during investigatory interviews. Identify who this sexual assault service provider or advocate is in advance of needing their services. Consider meeting with them. Offer a tour of your facility. Learn about your different roles and responsibilities. 
discuss facility entrance procedures, review confidentiality expe expectations, and so on. This conversation may be the foundation on which to craft a memorandum of understanding between your two agencies, which is required by the PREA standards. Let's move on to investigations. At minimum, your facility or agency is responsible for conducting an administrative investigation of all allegations of sexual abuse and sexual harassment. Investigations shall be conducted promptly, thoroughly, and objectively. As we discussed earlier, anyone conducting an investigation shall receive specialized training. At minimum, investigators shall gather and preserve evidence. They shall interview all parties and review all prior complaints. All of this information shall be compiled into a written report. The evidence shall be reviewed and weighed using a preponderance of the evidence standard. Preponderance of the evidence means more likely than not. Really, to determine that an incident occurred or is substantiated, just 51% of the evidence needs to support that finding. Please note, if an alleged abuser or victim leaves the facility for whatever reason, whether it by, be by transfer, resignation, or termination, the facility must continue with the investigation. Similarly, if a youth recants or takes back their initial report, the investigation must continue. It's possible that the investigation may not be as robust without critical interviews, for example, but the investigation must continue nonetheless. All allegations or investigations that reveal potentially Criminal conduct must be referred to law enforcement. Remember, staff on offender sexual activity is sexual abuse. It is always against the law, even if it appears the offender is or was a willing participant. This conduct shall always be referred to law enforcement. To ensure continued safety, the facility must have zero tolerance for retaliation. The facility shall establish a policy which protects all offenders and staff who report sexual abuse or sexual harassment or cooperate with an investigation from retaliation. For at least 90 days, those who report sexual abuse shall be monitored for retaliation. Retaliation monitoring includes status checks, reviewing disciplinary reports, housing or programming changes, negative performance reviews, and so on. If an individual reports actual or perceived retaliation, the monitor shall take necessary steps to remedy any retaliation. Retaliation monitoring must be documented. Monitoring may be discontinued if the incident is investigated and determined unfounded. Speaking of outcomes, what are the accepted dispositions of sexual abuse and sexual harassment investigations? They are substantiated, unsubstantiated, and unfounded. Substantiated means that an investigation was conducted and it was determined by review of the evidence that the incident more likely than not occurred. Unsubstantiated means that an investigation was conducted but the evidence was insufficient. A final determination as to whether or not the incident occurred was unable to be made. And finally, unfounded means that any allegation excuse me, means that the allegation was investigated and was determined to have not occurred. The PREA standards require that we notify alleged victims of the outcome of the investigation. In addition, the facility must also notify the alleged victim if the staff member is no longer posted on their unit or within the facility. We must also notify victims when the suspect has been convicted on a charge related to the sexual abuse. All documentation or all notification shall be documented. Of course, anyone found to have engaged in sexual abuse in a confinement setting is or should be subject to sanctions. Discipline extends to staff, contractors, volunteers, and offenders. Termination is the presumptive standard for staff found to have engaged in sexual abuse. Sanctions for staff and offenders shall correspond to the nature and circumstances of the acts committed, their disciplinary history, and sanctions imposed on others with comparable offenses. If an allegation is not able to be substantiated, but the facility has information to suggest an offender made a sexual abuse report in good faith, the facility shall not discipline the inmate for making a false report. If an investigation reveals that an offender engaged in consensual sexual contact, 
and the facility has a policy that prohibits consensual sexual activity, the facility may impose a sanction on those involved. To wrap up substantiated and unsubstantiated sexual abuse investigations, the facility shall conduct a sexual abuse incident review, or SAIR, as you see on the screen. The sexual abuse incident review must be completed within 30 days of the close of, again, substantiated or unsubstantiated sexual abuse investigations. A sexual abuse incident review is not needed following the close of an unfounded investigation. Essentially, this review consists of a team of people who consider the circumstances of the incident in order to develop strategies to better prevent, detect, and respond to sexual abuse. The team should include upper-level management and include input from supervisors, investigators, and medical or mental health care clinicians. This team will work to determine whether there are policy or procedure, physical plant, video monitoring technology, or staffing level modifications that can or need to be made. They shall also consider if the incident was motivated by race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, gang affiliation, or other group dynamics. The findings of this review shall be compiled into a report and should include any recommendations for improvement. Finally, there are a host of data collection related standards. These standards pertain to reporting data to the Department of Justice via the Survey of Sexual Victimization, preparing an annual report, record storage and retention, and more. As I stated when we began this discussion about the response-related standards, let's pause and circle back to first responder duties for just a minute. The PREA standards outline different first responder responsibilities based upon a staff member's primary role, that of security or non-security. It may be that your facility asks all staff to wear security and non-security hats. If that's the case, I would suggest ensuring your staff is well acquainted and comfortable with the security staff first responder duties as they are more comprehensive than the non-security responsibilities. You'll notice that some of the duties displayed are in capital letters. These are the responsibilities that the PREA standards mandate. At minimum, security staff must separate the alleged victim and suspect, preserve and protect the crime scene, request that the alleged victim not take any actions that could destroy physical evidence, and ensure that the alleged suspect not take any actions that might destroy physical evidence. The other items listed may be good practice depending upon the policies and procedures of your facility. Consider asking basic questions of the alleged victim. Be aware this is not the time to investigate. However, basic who, what, where, when, and why questions, excuse me, not why questions, basic who, what, when, and where questions will help to guide the first response. For example, if the alleged incident happened five minutes ago, your first response may look quite different than if the alleged incident occurred five weeks ago, five months ago, or five years ago. You'll have to separate the alleged victim and suspect and be mindful of physical evidence in this scenario. That may not be the case if the alleged incident happened five months ago, for example. When, gave, when gathering basic information, avoid asking why questions. Despite our best intentions, why questions tend to have an undertone of blame. Throughout, attempt to return some control to the victim by asking for their consent. For example, can we talk about this now? Where do you feel most comfortable talking about this? With whom do you feel most comfortable? Describe what may happen next. What can they expect following their report? Next, notify a supervisor. Separate the victim and the suspect if it's appropriate. Preserve and protect the evidence or crime scene. Restrict movement in and out of the incident location. Remember, not only may evidence be in a particular space, but it also may, may be on a person's body. Request that the alleged victim not take any actions that may destroy physical evidence. The critical word is request. Do not require or order a victim to refrain from brushing their teeth, changing clothes, showering, using the toilet, eating, drinking, or any other action that may compromise physical evidence. Give them the opportunity to choose. If they need to take any of these actions, they should be allowed to do so. On the other hand, 
ensure that the alleged suspect not take any actions that could destroy physical evidence. They are not allowed the same opportunity to choose. Identify a safe, dry location that they can be placed in until evidence may be collected by your agency or law enforcement jurisdiction. Finally, document the reported or observed incident and follow-up actions. Throughout the response, remain calm, supportive, professional, and respectful. Understand that this is a highly sensitive time for victims. As we've already discussed, they may display a range of, of emotions. Use effective listening skills. Maintain a non-judgmental approach. Respect a person's gender identity or sexual orientation. All of these responses will increase their sense of safety. A quick note, this process may not unfold in this linear or concrete manner. It's possible that separating the alleged victim and suspect trumps asking all questions. Preserving evidence may not be relevant in some cases if the example or if the incident, for example, happened at another facility months ago. Those who are identified as non-security staff have slightly different responsibilities. The action steps in capital letters are required by the standards. That is, notifying a security supervisor and requesting that the alleged victim not take any actions that may destroy physical evidence. The other items, like asking basic questions and documenting, may be good practices in your facility. Let's shift gears slightly now and discuss our final topic, that of professionalism and boundaries. Developing and maintaining professional relationships are an extension of our prevention conversation earlier. Cultivating professionalism and healthy boundaries within any facility will foster a safer environment for all. What are some red flags of loose or poor boundaries? Listed here are some examples. Making sexual jokes with or in front of offenders, using offender nicknames, discussing personal issues with or in front of offenders, allowing an offender to have special privileges, trusting an offender to have your back, doing special favors for an offender, gossiping about staff with or in front of offenders, and complaining about supervisors or your job in front of an offender. This is just a brief list. I imagine there are others that come to mind for you. Acknowledge that some offenders can be manipulative and may seek out vulnerable staff that may appear timid or who may be experiencing, who may be experiencing difficulty in their personal lives. Be vigilant. Hold that boundary at all times. The reality is that a majority of staff have worked in a confinement setting and observed these or similar behaviors or interactions. Poor boundaries may snowball in a fraternization, and fraternization may snowball into sexual abuse. I hope that there's a culture within your agency or facility that encourages reporting, an environment in which staff feel safe enough to share their concerns about their own or others blurred boundaries with offenders before it snowballs. Consider reflecting on your professional relationships with the offenders in your care and custody. This is a list of questions that staff may want to self-reflect on throughout their careers. It is not an exhaustive list, but can raise awareness and possibly identify red flags. Share this resource with your coworkers Pin it to a bulletin board in a break room, for example. Discuss these questions during a staff meeting. Identify strategies to support healthy boundaries and professional relationships. So what are the hallmarks of professionalism? They are, or include, reporting knowledge of or information of sexual abuse or sexual harassment, reporting suspicious behavior, Remaining respectful, compassionate, consistent, being trauma-informed, avoiding a sexualized environment, managing your own stress, avoiding personal disclosures, using safe and effective communication, remaining mindful of nonverbal communication. The power of communication as a sexual abuse prevention tool cannot be understated. 
At its core, the Prison Rape Elimination Act provides confinement facilities with a roadmap to prevent, detect, and respond to sexual abuse and sexual harassment. Agencies can only eliminate sexual abuse and sexual harassment with prevention measures. Communication and respect are powerful prevention tools and extend to all offender interactions. Communication, at its simplest, is the exchange of information between two or more people. No matter what role you play within your facility, communication is a part of every interaction you have, and it's essential to what we do. Safe, effective, and respectful communication is important, as, commu as poor communication can impact safety. Poor communication can also deter incident reporting. What is respect? Respect is acknowledging that a person has worth as a human being. It includes treating a person humanely and with basic dignity. Respecting an individual does not mean you are condoning criminal behavior, their choices, or circumstances. Respect sets a tone, a tone which leaves no room for a sexualized environment and paves the way for safety. It allows offenders to feel valued and in turn value staff, including their authority. It allows offenders to feel more comfortable reporting difficult feelings, thoughts, or incidents. And when staff members hold firm expectations, it creates a less contentious, antagonistic environment, thereby minimizing discrimination, aggression, and abuse. Offering respect extends beyond responding to an incident or allegation of sexual abuse or sexual harassment. It is not a one-time courtesy. Respect is cultivated over time and includes a pattern of equal, fair, and consistent verbal and nonverbal communication. Showing a person respect is a strength, not a weakness. Respecting others increases the likelihood that you will be respected in return, and that may be the critical difference in a tense situation or difficult conflict. When we think of communication, the first thing that comes to mind for most people is verbal communication the words we say. But if we look at communication more closely, we realize that communication is more than just what we say. It also includes how those words are said. The tone of voice we use when communicating can alter the meaning of words we say. Body language or nonverbal communication also contributes significantly to an interaction. Studies have shown that over 70% of communication is nonverbal. Nonverbal communication can reinforce what was said verbally or can change the meaning of that verbal communication. Respectful nonverbal communication includes making appropriate eye contact, maintaining an appropriate personal distance, and ensuring that facial expressions and posture reflect the correct message. Body language can also express that you are paying attention and listening, which is an important part of the communication process. Actions like nodding, smiling, or using other facial expressions can help show you're listening. Attentive listening means that you're giving the speaker your attention and allow the speaker to finish before asking questions. Attentive listening can decrease defensiveness and open lines of communication. Words are powerful. The language staff uses can help create a culture of safety and respect. If staff uses disrespectful, offensive, or abusive language, it creates an environment that invites and condones the same behavior from offenders. Language and actions set a standard and impact the well-being of coworkers and offenders. In all communication, be aware of your own beliefs and how they affect your perceptions and how the words you use may be offensive to others. Accept that you will sometimes say the wrong thing as oftentimes, for example, you won't know someone's gender identity or sexual orientation unless they share this information with you. Here are some tips. Use professional and culturally appropriate language. Phrases like please and thank you are simple ways to show respect. Consider that people of a different racial, ethnic, or social background may verbally or non-verbally communicate in alternate ways. Do not use slang or slurs. Do not perpetuate stereotypes or make assumptions. Language should be person-centered. Whenever possible, ask how a person chooses to identify rather than making assumptions. Focus on the behavior and avoid judging the person. 
Be an empathetic rather than sympathetic listener. Use gender neutral or preferred pronouns when possible. Employing these verbal and nonverbal communication tips will help keep the lines of communication open so others, including offenders, will consider you professional and fair. Not only will your good communication model positive behaviors for others, but offenders will be more likely to provide you with essential information when you need it. Safe, effective, and respectful communication is essential at all times, but becomes even more important when there is a conflict or incident. Communication can easily break down during conflict. Acknowledging other people's points of view and sharing ideas respectfully can assist with conflict resolution and enhance safety. This brings us to the conclusion of our conversation. The grand finale, resources. I recommend you visit any or all of the resources listed here to learn more about sexual assault or sexual abuse in the community or confinement, including the Prison Rape Elimination Act. The PREA Resource Center especially has a plethora of resources, best practices, frequently asked questions, tools, tips, and tricks to move your facility towards greater compliance. The Wisconsin Department of Corrections PREA office may also be a resource to you. You are encouraged to reach out with any questions. We're happy to work alongside you to find solutions. Thank you for participating in this conversation. We hope that you share this content with others at your facility who might benefit. Finally, best of luck on your ongoing journey of PREA compliance.